The worn down dystopian world of Inky Bilal's work, The Nikopol Trilogy, is a graphic novel that has a lot going on within it. Over the course of three chapters, there are a number of characters introduced, different settings, and each chapter has their own point of view. For the most part, they had little continuity with the original plot of the chapters that came before each one. The only things tying them together being the main characters Heracles, Nicopole, and Horus, the Egyptian god. Throughout all three, Gods of Chaos, La Femme Pied, and Foy Equator, the characters are for the most part flat and stagnant with little development. As for the plots, all of them had endings that align with modernist writings in that they are bleak and non-traditional. I found, however, the most intriguing facets of Bilal's work to be that of setting, themes, and his visual aesthetic. These three topics alone, I believe, are what make the Nikopol trilogy what it is, a graphic novel about the absurdity and meaningless of life. The settings for each chapter all take place in an alternate world that has gone through a third world war. Each of them takes place in different years and different locations. Paris in 2023, London and Berlin in 2025, and the fictional city of Equator City in Africa in the year 2034. In Paris 2023, the city is under a fascist ruling power at the command of one jean Ferdinand Bunglieri. The fact that this is taking place in what, we, in what we consider to be the city of love makes details of this future Paris all the more pungent. When Horus, present within Nicopole's body, is catching Nicopole up to speed on what's happened to Paris in the 30 years he's spent orbiting Earth, he says, quote, most women of childbearing age are automatically sent to the Holy Savior Maternity Center, a gigantic and ominously sterile underground clinic of sorts, where birth rates are scientifically accelerated. This programming is designed to produce male children about 80% of the time, all destined for government armies. Page 31. End quote. With the fascist rule came the stripping of Paris's personality and iconic image of romance. This Paris lacks artistic expression. Higher society is made up of only men who wear makeup to show their status. And the lower class are reduced to squalor with a lack of education. Another prominent feature to this setting is the casual presence of aliens living side by side with humans. Even the cities of London and Berlin in 2025 don't seem to be too far off from Paris's condition. In London, it's not shown how much this city is different from the one we know today. However, with militarized police driving tanks, an ethnic war being fought in the streets, and a river as red as blood, it's safe to say that it, it too has undergone dramatic changes. Then there's Berlin, which also has a civil unrest happening by Islamo-Christians and it is the only autonomous enclave within the Czechoslovak Empire. Though I've primarily described the atmosphere of these cities, the key to the setting of these cities is World War III and it being a repeat of World War II, specifically for Paris and Berlin. Bilal, wanting to imagine a future that doubles as an alternative reality, imagines what would happen to these two cities if the events of World War II had changed. What would happen to Paris if it was never liberated from Nazis? What if the Soviets gained full control over Berlin instead of splitting it and eventually returning it back to Germany? The influence of these settings comes from the author's real-life setting of 80s Paris, the time and place where all three of these chapters were written. Inky Bilal released his chapters in 1980, 1986, and 1992. During the 80s, there were a lot of societal changes that occurred. The first socialist president took office, right-wing nationalists were on the rise along with anti-fascist skinheads, AIDS became an epidemic, pirate radio could be heard, and post-punk and new wave were gaining increased popularity. Then you have Berlin's Wall, which was still a major controversy until it was finally broken down in 1989, just three years after the release of La Femme Pied, where Berlin is shown under complete Soviet rule. 
and a short 1980s documentary called Today in France, uploaded to YouTube as Inky Bilal Documentary 1986. It is said, quote, He is not trying to forecast the future and finds himself incapable of saying how the world will evolve. He admits he is no optimist either, just like everybody else. He draws these images and tells these stories because it is a world he feels at home in. End quote. This lack of optimism shows clearly in his visual aesthetic too. In that same YouTube video, the narrator says that Inky, when he works alone, draws the illustration first. This method helps to embed the atmosphere that Bilal is wanting to portray. It can be felt more in the literary aspect of the novel, since it is most heavily influenced by what came before. Quote, He says he has always found it more interesting graphically to work with tough, hard images. Situations which reach out and grab the reader, aggress him almost, rather than paint a bed of roses and smug optimism. End quote. The visual world of Bilal, despite the futuristic setting and presence of aliens and advanced technology, is purposefully given a grimy, worn-down texture. Everything looks aged with various cracks in the walls, tattered rugs, and beat-up vehicles. In that same YouTube video, it's said that Bilal does this to give everything, even the inanimate objects, a charged history, a past that can be felt. Bilal's story would not be as impactful without this trait, as it goes against everything most people would imagine the future to look like. Amongst everything in Bilal's real world that has influenced his fictional world of the Nicopole trilogy is the French poet Charles Baudelaire. Baudelaire is not only serving as an influence, but also a literary device. Of all the themes that weave their way in and out of the trilogy, the French poet is the only one that has a constant presence. In the first tale, Gods of Chaos, the recurring themes I've noticed are pursuit of power, control, rebellion, and betrayal. In the second, La Femme Pied, the primary theme is detachment, both from one's external surroundings and internal turmoil. The final chapter, Foy Equator, has themes such as never-ending cycles, new beginnings, and familial curses. A few of these themes overlap and appear, though not as strongly, in other chapters. With Control, it's shown both in its pursuit and loss of it, the most glaring example being with the relationship between Horus and Nicopole. In every chapter, Nicopole becomes Horus's puppet, he constantly threatens Nicopole with the disconnection of his consciousness and routinely takes full possession of his body. Multiple times, Horus leaves Nicopole with either a destroyed and warped mind or completely wipes his memory and personality entirely, much to Nicopole's protest. It is in both of these outcomes where the reader is given the most crucial piece of the puzzle to Bilal's message. Every time Nicopole's mind crumbles, he can do nothing but recite poems written by Charles Baudelaire. The first time Nicopole speaks of Baudelaire, it is used as a cover-up when guards come to get him dressed for an event and ask who he was speaking to just before they entered the room. Nicopole responds, quote, Oh, no, uh, I was reciting a poem by Baudelaire. Love that stuff, don't you? My love... Do you recall the thing we saw, that fair, sweet summer morn? At a turn in the path a foul carcass on a gravel-strewn bed. End quote. From here on out, however, he begins to recite more of his poems without any control whatsoever, to the point where he's unable to utter any other thoughts and is eventually put into a psychiatric ward by the end of the first chapter. By the end of the third, after having his memory and personality wiped, he once again constantly recites Baudelaire. Throughout the trilogy, Nicopole recites parts of various poems, the first being Flowers of Evil, when first signs of his mental downfall appear. La Revenant comes just as Nicopole is about to be assassinated. The Fountain of Blood is recited after he's brought back to life by the Egyptian gods. The Litanies of Satan when he's condemned to life in the ward, and the dancing serpent after Horace wipes his memory and leaves him for good. 
With Charles Baudelaire, it cannot be overlooked the level of bleakness found in his works. In seeing this, I did research and found that he is considered to be the person to have coined the term modernity. This, of course, brings to mind our lesson on modernism, and as it turns out, they are closely related to each other. Having this in mind makes sense of Bilal's works. All the characters start out with goals and ambitions that, in the end, simply don't matter. Nicopole, wanting to return Paris to the society that he once knew, gets made into a puppet and has all of his memories wiped. Even though Paris's political state did successfully change, by the beginning of the third chapter you find out that the fascist regime has taken over again. It is then never mentioned again. This gives me the impression that what's happened no longer matters and to move on. Then there's Jill, a journalist who receives a tip from a friend about a newspaper article that has gone from the year 2025 back to 1993. This friend of hers gets murdered and results in her setting out to Berlin to investigate this mysterious article. However, this original story gets completely overshadowed by Jill's guilt when she kills multiple men who attempt to rape her throughout the chapter. With each death she experiences, a blood stain that appears on her hand gradually grows across her body, nearly engulfing every inch of her pale skin. To deal, she, on multiple occasions, takes a varying number of memory-wiping pills to suppress her issues. In the end, after regaining her mental stability, she realizes that these murders and rape attempts never happened. This and the concept of detachment are both confirmed by Jill herself. Quote, With terrifying detachment, I've just read over a copy of what I wrote on the script writer. Murders, Thames colored blood, was I out of my mind? End quote. As for the article that was sent to the past, well, nothing. There's no other mention of this article by the author or the characters, and the chapter ends with Jill flying off into the sunset with Nicopole and Horace after they've helped her recover her stability. In these final pandals, she ponders on the dangers of attempting to fall in love, but then finds solace in knowing that if things go wrong, she still has two pills left. This lack of a traditional ending makes its most prominent appearance in the third chapter where there is a director making a film about Nicopol and Jill who have gotten together at the end of chapter 2. What is most curious is that this director, Giancarlo Donadoni, has a history of never finishing a film. Quote, Do you realize that in over 40 years of producing and directing, I've never been able to wrap a single film? There's always something. War, crisis, bankruptcy, an actress committing suicide, a shortage of film stock. That fucks everything up. End quote. What is most tragic is that, in speaking to Nico, Nicopol's son, he claims to have a feeling that he will finish this film, but then dies of a heart attack later on during the filming. When Jill hears of this news, she, once again, becomes overwhelmed by the emotional pain that she chooses to wipe her memories for the last time. Specifically, anything and everything about her relationship with Nicopole. After which, she then chooses to finish what Dona Doni never could, but in a way that very much aligns with the idea of modernity and modernism. The very last panels of the trilogy show Jill filming Nicopole and his new lover flying off in ominous clouds. When the cameraman tells her when to cut, she replies with, quote, Don't cut. Let it keep rolling till it runs out. Till it goes black. Till the end. End quote. This brings to mind the idea that we don't choose when the story ends. It ends when it ends, and there's nothing we can do about it. This becomes evident when taking note of a few important details with the ending of this tale. For starters, in addition to having his memory wiped, Horace also left Nicopole the power of immortality. 
Again, Horus has taken Nikopol's fate out of his own hands and forced upon him a never-ending tale. The leaders of Equator City find an immortal human to be a virus and decide to launch him into space aboard their experimental Noah's Ark spacecraft. However, not knowing that he has a son that looks just like him in every way, they mistakenly kidnap and launch Nico into outer space. The ship, ironically, is designated to orbit Earth for 30 years, the same as his father's time spent in a cryo chamber before crashing back to Earth and starting this chain of events. What's eerie is that in the final panels, as the film crew is shooting the plane, Jill notes that a star can be seen in the background that is likely Nico's craft. Quote, Donadoni would have liked this shot. I just know it. He would have liked the tight framing at the end, with his characters flying away in a plane, that cloud with its strange tail, and even that tiny bright spot moving across the sky, probably a satellite. He would have gone crazy trying to make it into a symbol for something. End quote. The fact that Nico is on it is not known to anyone else. In fact, Nico Pohl's new lover believes him to be Nico himself. In ending this graphic novel, I was left with so many questions. What was the point? What about all these different open-ended plot lines? Then I realized that I had the same feelings and questions as when I finished reading Kafka's The Metamorphosis. The answers to all of my questions weren't the ones this graphic novel was meant to give, because there aren't any. It's not meant to have a happy ending. Not all the plots are meant to be addressed because, like the director's films, life gets in the way and keeps you from completing them. This is taken even further with the introduction of memory wiping as an easy-to-take drug. Due to the characters being so complex, they tend to be incapable of dealing with their problems and thus turn to these alternative forms to suppress or bypass them altogether, leaving them to forget what it is that they were initially seeking out to accomplish. One concept that is crucial to modernity and modernism is that of absurdity. The idea behind this philosophy is that the universe, with all the greatness that it contains, is ultimately pointless. The universe is merely a container for random chaos without any meaning or direction and promises nothing. Anything can happen and we, in reality, have very little control over what happens to us. Existentialism, however, takes this a step further and says that this is a good thing because it means we should not fear having to make the, quote, right decision because there isn't one. The family cursed with the Nikopol family seems to be not having a choice, to be constantly oppressed and having their decisions hijacked by a higher power. Jill, on the other hand, does make her own decisions. Though she finds it too difficult to deal with her pain and opts to forget them, it is still, in the end, her decision to do so. It is here that I have found Jill to be representative of humanity as a whole. After all, who among us hasn't at some point wished for some simple method to rid us of our pain and suffering?